Morning. morning. Carol said to me as we were sitting there, two things. One, she said, this is odd, sitting on the other side of it. You know, it's odd is you, you just find a place in church and that's where you're at. And if you're on the other side of your spouse or whatever, and you just don't feel quite right. The other thing she says was, she says, you know what? I love this church. I do, you know, I, I do too. So we love you guys. We love you too. Thank you. Everyone. I appreciate hearing that. Um, about once a year, uh, not any more than that generally, but about once a year, during the year sometime, I talk about money. Okay? I'm going to be preaching about money this morning, okay? So I'll make it very clear. Uh, don't get excited. I'm not going to pick your pockets or anything like that. I'm not going to beat the drums for money as I see some TV evangelists do all that kind of stuff. But it's by the same token, Money is a significant part of our lives. And I think it's important for us to see, look at this from a Christian perspective to see where we're at as far as our money is concerned. Because all of us have to deal with it. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it. Luke 12, 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or an arbitrator over you? They said to them, take care, be on guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life did not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of the rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, what should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this, I will pull down my barns and build bigger, larger ones, and there I will store my grain and my goods. I will say to my soul, soul you have ample goods. Laid up for many years, relax, eat, drink, be merry. And God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. The things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. You and I need to carefully consider the role of money in our lives. Do it with me, okay? In the first three Gospels, one out of every six verses deals with the use or abuse of money. I want you to see where money is, is, is as far as our, our scripture is concerned, okay? 16, 16 of the 34 parables that Jesus told deal specifically and directly with money. There are over 500 verses in the Bible that deal with prayer, but there are over how many? How, how don't you guess? How many verses do you suppose there are that deal with money? 500 deal with prayer. How many verses deal with money? 1,000. 2,500. No one who seriously follows Jesus can avoid this subject. Jesus proceeds this parable with his statement. He said, watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed. A man does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Now, folks, this is true. Our lives do not consist in the abundance of our possessions. We all know that when we get lost in this whole thing somehow or another. Elizabeth McKee Gore said something that puts our lives in perspective. This is what she said. If you get a raise, you think you smile, you go out for drinks, perhaps you celebrate. You have a raise. Then she contrasts this celebration with the lives of people in Mali, West Africa. In Mali, she said, if a child lives to their first birthday, they celebrate by giving him or her a name. They don't name their children before them because mortality rates are so high under the age of one. 
Families that have children over five years old are thought to be very wealthy. Because between disease and high food prices, the chances of having multiple children over five are slim indeed. Here she says you can find the true meaning of wealth. Think about that for a moment. If you have children over the age of five, you're wealthy. How much would you take for the health of your children? If, you're, if you have people who love you and you're wealthy, healthy and you're, and you're uh, you know, wealthy to a certain degree, you're, you're rich. I don't care what your balance sheet says. If you have enough to eat and clothes to wear in a warm house on a cold night, and then a little more to share perhaps, you're very rich indeed, folks. And that means that all of us are rich. Melra Fuller, founder of Habitat for Humanity, once noted that an increasing number of affluent people in our country are doing what wealthy people do in developing countries. They build walls around themselves to keep the poor away. You ever look at the television, you see that in the poor countries where there, you know, there's such a degree of distance between the wealthy and the, and the poor. And they don't share, she also says. Religious folks among the wealthy feel a lot, theologize that God has blessed them. They say they have worked hard, or maybe their parents, or husband, or wife worked hard, so they deserve all the possessions they have, and they're entitled to the luxurious lifestyle they enjoy. They feel like they deserve it. They feel no obligation to share significantly with others. Fuller knows that while he was in the visit a Habitat Project in Nebraska, his host drove him past a new six and a half million dollar home. What in the world would you do with a six and a half million dollar home? Anyway, of a local business tycoon. It was enormous, surrounded by a high fence. He was told that the owner had to install buzzers in the house so the family members could find each other. Folks, when is enough enough? Futurist Faith Popcorn tells us that a new phrase has been coined for opulent homes like this business tycoons. They're called starter castes. You heard that? Starter castes. The building of the most of these starter castes occurred during the before the recent real estate meltdown, of course, but still they point to a very glaring development that is occurring right here in our own country, the widening gulf between the haves and the have-nots. Sounds very much like a parable. Familiar story. Uncomfortable ending, but it's a familiar story. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And he said, Well, I, I, I'll, do, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my grain and my goods, and I'll save myself. You have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be there. You've got to think. God said, Are you a fool? This very night, your life will be demanded from who will get what you have prepared for yourself. And Jesus concluded his parable like this. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. It wasn't just this man, you see. Jesus was talking to him. Now, I'd like to think he wasn't talking to you and me, but I have a feeling he might have been. We may not think of ourselves as rich when we compare ourselves to somebody living in a six and a half million dollar home. If we compare what we have to the citizens of a nation like Haiti, we are wealthy folks, wealthy indeed. Now, I want to make something very clear. There's nothing wrong with having money. 1 Timothy 6.10 warns against the love of money. There's the key. Many people read that verse wrong. It's not the money, but the love of money which is condemned. There's nothing wrong with having money. In fact, the first foolish thing you can do with money is to deny its importance. There are some things that only money can buy. Braces for the kids. Good education. Dependable car to drive to work. Decent clothes to wear. A person in our society with no money is in deep trouble. I know what it's like. I grew up poor. But it is. I never thought about it that way so much, but I was poor. And the thing about 
being poor is, and I've discovered this in my life, is the loss of power. And you never think about that. But if you have money, you, you're powerless. And as a result, you know, that limits what you can do and not do in life. And it's not very much fun either. I remember I was in high school. Um, I had a buddy of mine and I, he was, he lived out by Bowen. And I spent half the time with him. You know, he'd run around together all over the place and everything. I remember I see with him one night, I may have told you this story, I'll tell you again. I see with him one night, we got up the next morning and got ready to go to school and we, we got, well, we left the room. I noticed that one of the kind of desk there that was changed. What was that chain laying there in his desk? When we got home, got ready to go to school. Um, when we walked out, he just walked out. I couldn't believe it. He didn't, he didn't need that change. And he just left. And I, I was struck by that because I'd never been able to do anything. I never thought that people could do that. Um, so there's nothing wrong with wishing we had more money. In fact, some of us need to give more attention to our finances. Did you know, folks, that 80, 85 out of 100 Americans have less than $250 savings when they reach the age of 65? 85 out of 100 don't have $250 when they're 65. Did you know that in the event of a loss of income or an unexpected major expense, the average American family is three to six weeks away from bankruptcy? The man in Jesus' parable was not foolish because he had money. Money is important in our world. The rich man was foolish not for having money, but because of what he did with that money. That's the key. This brings us to the second foolish thing you can do with your money, and that is keep it to yourself. The rich man thought to himself, well, I did all, all one place to store my crops. I'll do this. I'll tear down barns and build bigger ones and store my goods and things. They don't have plenty of good things laid up for many years to take life easy to eat, drink, and marry. Now that sounds pretty good to most of us. The rich man decided to, to live the good life that we talked about. Surrounded himself with nice things to make life easy. The rich man made the same mistake that many of us make. We assume that all we need for a contented life were a lot of nice things. We just had enough money. Wrong. Nobody ever found genuine happiness in mere things. Happiness comes from relationships. Happiness comes from sharing. And there are many people who have only money and they are miserable. No joy. I have an example here of this. Listen, it's almost hard to believe. John Paul Getty, remember the other you know name? Was one of the richest men in the world. And yet, according to the book by Malcolm Forbes titled, What Happened to Their Kids, Getty was a lousy father. When one of Getty's grandsons was kidnapped, Getty refused to pay the ransom to get him back. He reasoned that if he paid the kidnappers, then all of his grandchildren would be getting kidnapped for ransom. The kidnappers only asked for a million dollars. This was pocket change to Paul Getty. Even if all 14 of his grandchildren were kidnapped and ransomed for this much money, it would have made a bit of difference to him. They paid it with ease. Four months after the first ransom note was sent, the kidnappers cut off the boy's right ear and mailed it to Getty. Finally, Getty agreed to pay the ransom, but he insisted that his son, the boy's father, pay him back with interest. I sincerely doubt that Paul Getty's money brought him real happiness. Happiness comes from sharing what you have with others. Most parents know that. There's far more joy in giving to your children than hoarding it for your own pleasures. I guarantee you that the joy of giving goes farther than that. Why do people move beyond their own families to give to people in need and to cause them which they believe? I hope that's where you find yourself. I know that there are many of you who get real joy out of your support of our church. I 
want you to know that your support is appreciated. Some of you would cut back on your on some of your own personal expenses before you would cut back on your giving to the church. Not because someone's holding a gun to your head, but because you get real satisfaction of taking part in God's work in the world. And I appreciate it and I understand it and I know that. Here's another one. You read about the couple in Florida who had been married 21 years and were getting divorced. This is a classic. The terms of the settlement call for the woman to be able to maintain a reasonable lifestyle. Since the couple listed their assets at $100 million, here's what the judge decided. She could fly to New York once a month to get her hair fixed. She would receive $2,600 a month to eat out. How much, how much could you eat out with $2,600? I mean, how in the world would you spend that much on food? $2,600 a month to eat. She would receive a liberal expense account for gasoline, oil, and maintenance of her $100,000 Mercedes. That's her In addition, she would receive each month $10,446 for vacations, $6,452 for clothes each month, $1,592 for groceries, $1,440 for local beauty parlors, $1,407 miscellaneous, and $171 for pet care, and then $20 for church and charities. Is there anything wrong with that picture? $100 million and she's giving 20 bucks a month to the church and charities. I believe Christ would say to her, you fool. You fool. Wealth is for sharing, not for keeping. Sure, there is satisfaction in the little luxuries of life, but not as much as being involved in something great and lasting. The first foolish thing you can do with money is to deny its value. The second foolish thing you can do is to hoard it for yourself. Of course, the most foolish thing you can do with money is to allow it to become your God. Did you know that on Black Monday, October 19, 1987, the Dow Jones average plunged 508 points? As it plunged, the Pacific Stock Exchange requested that a suicide watch be placed on the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. During the same week in Miami, a longtime speculator who lost Large sums in the market's crash walked into the local Merrill Lynch brokerage office and requested to see his broker and the office manager. He opened his briefcase, took out a handgun, and shot and killed both men and then himself. A friend commented his entire life was devoted to the market and he collapsed and he collapsed around him. So it is with those who make their money their God. Henry Ford. By the way, I was, I guess on television this week, so I'm a history net, as you all know. I didn't know that Henry Ford was uh, a racist. He was an anti-Semitic, yeah. In fact, he supported Hitler in a big way. Anyway, Henry Ford was asked an associate about his life goals, and the man replied that his goal was to make a million dollars. A few days later, Ford gave him a pair of glasses made out of two silver dollars. The old man put them on and asked how well he could see. The man said, well, nothing. The dollars were in the way. Earlier this century, a man gave $100,000 to build a college in Liberia. By the 1940s, the college had grown. Thousands of young Africans had been educated there. On the anniversary of the college's founding, the administration decided it was time to say thank you to his benefactor. It took months to finally track him down. You see, the man had lost everything in the crash of 1929 and was living in a little house on the south side of Chicago. Twice he refused to see the representative from the college, but he finally agreed to see them. At their insistence, he was flown to Africa for a celebration of the college. As he looked over the campus, he filled with hundreds of students, he whispered to the college president, the only thing I have kept is what I gave away. Only what 
they gave away, only what we give away is ours, really. No honor. If Jesus' parable doesn't trouble you, you're our denial. Because it troubles me. But Jesus' parable, It's just uncomfortable, doesn't it? I mean, you know, well, we're not rich, but we all know that in compared to what? We're rich. Some of them protest and say, but Pastor Ron, you we're saved by grace, not by works. It's true. But salvation means that Christ comes into our hearts and takes residence there. We become like him, and that's what it means to be saved. It doesn't mean we are perfect. Boy, that's for sure. It certainly doesn't mean we are all Christ being for us to be. But it does mean that we are on the path. It means that we have Jesus' heart for a world in need. So where does it leave us? Do we take all we own and sell it and give the proceeds to the poor? Is that what is being said here? I don't think so. I think it's clear from the scripture that Jesus calls only a few people to do this kind of radical commitment. At the same time, however, we need to take Jesus' teachings seriously. So here's the final thing we need to see. The extent of our giving is the most accurate gauge we have for the authenticity of our faith. If you want to know how your faith is doing, look at your kid. Back up. Here's that. He said it very clearly as he said, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Final story. Many years ago, missionary Bob Roberts was a guest speaker in a church. In this service, he was sharing his burden for hungry children in the Philippines. Afterwards, a young boy, about seven years old, came up to him and said, Jesus spoke to me tonight while you were telling us about the hungry children. When you said that for a quarter of a day you could feed a child and give him a vitamin, I thought, I gotta help. But I didn't know how I could do that. Then Jesus spoke to me, he said. The lad extended his hand and said, This is my shell collection. I believe Jesus wants me to give these shells to help the children. With those words, he placed the shells in Robert's hand. Robert's accepted the shells, but wondered what in the world he's gonna do. Hungry children with shells. A few weeks later, Robert spoke to another congregation. Reaching into his pocket, he pulled out the seashells and told about that boy who desired to feed hungry children. At the end of the service, a man approached Roberts and said, I'd like to buy those shells. I'll give you a hundred dollars for them. Bob Roberts added this comment. My freckle-faced friend may never know that his sacrificing offering provided 400 meals for Filipino children that would have gone hungry otherwise. Now, he may not have understood how the Lord would use this small gift to feed the hungry, but he knew God wanted him to give, give what he had. That's what he did. That's all that he's asked. All that's asked of any of us is that. Nothing more. Nothing less is to give what we have. We know what God wants us to do. We all learn to live more simply. We need to, for Pete's sakes, we need to evaluate our living, our level of giving, and we need to understand that the extent of our giving is the most accurate gauge we have of the authenticity of our faith. He said it best, of course, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Where's your treasure? That's the question. Let's pray together. Father, this, this story, this parable is, makes us uncomfortable. If we look at our bank accounts and our level of giving, and, and I know personally I, it's, it's not where it ought to be. Often that's the case. And sometimes we we can work our way through that and understand and then we finally find where we really are at and that's, that's a good thing because you'll join us in that. You'll help us to understand where we should be. And we pray that you help us, each one of us, to do that very thing. To see where we can best serve you in our, our giving. So help us, oh God, we pray in Jesus' name.
Amen. Hymn number.